You know, the fundraisings are not necessarily an example of the underlying activity. Because what you're looking at is, the first thing that you look at is the uh, kind of economic larger macro, uh, where the statistics are off the charts, right? You know, in, in six years' time, two-thirds of the uh, world's middle class will be residing in Asia, and that's 1.75 billion people. So you start looking at all these different uh, dynamics um, in terms of how many billionaires and millionaires are being created per week, per month, uh, and you look at the changes that are coming through government policy, regulations, and, and business. That's not always captured by uh, the funds that are in the market, because uh, if you look at the penetration of private equity, in particular in Asia, relative to the United States, that also has quite a robust economic type feel to it. it it's it's minuscule, um, and you know that in itself presents the fact that there will be many more GPs, more larger funds, more activity taking place. So when I look at fundraise over the next ten years, it'll be very robust. It'll be very interesting. But one side is very straightforward. Um, at the end of the day, if the GPs want to raise capital from specific investors, they have to follow uh, rules of disclosure, uh, governance, um, practice, and you know, there are, like I said to you, a number of regulations also that they have to respect. As a result of that, the, the, um, the internal processes that we see of general partners today is really improving leaps and bounds in terms of transparency, governance, and reporting, which then allows the investors to have a very good understanding of what they're committing capital to. The, the other side of the question, which is a little bit more complex, is there will be a gap where the amount of money interested to invest in Asia will exceed uh, what they call the criteria of a good manager, uh, which then will push managers to larger funds. Um, and the question then is one of discipline and alignment that then can potentially get compromised. And even though we have the proper governance and the proper, uh, the proper reporting and, and the, the proper um, execution of the business of the general partner, it might not be in alignment um, because the, the, um, the popularity of that general partner. And that's something that I think in the short term, which could be in the next three to five years, the general partners need to think about very carefully. The nuance you're touching on is that of the large LPs. The large LPs are working with significant amounts of capital. Commitment sizes to funds sometimes can be as little as 350. They can't go below that, with a preference to be 500. Um, to use American jargon, um, you know, they need to be able to move the needle. But when you're dealing with pools of assets that are 150, 200, 300 billion in size, how do you move the needle? Right? Um, and one of the ways that these investors um, you know, have come to see an ability to impact their returns is through co-invest. And it's important that general partners realize that these investors don't want to do 5 times 20. They want to do 1 times 100. In, the, in some cases, they want to do 300 to 500 in, in a go, right? Um, and that, that changes very much the texture of um, uh, the activity. And you also have to remember that you know, the general partners in the first cycle of the Asian private equity um, uh, you know, world or uh, evolution um, were, were, uh, they were almost a little bit pre-IPO oriented in terms of the constitution of their portfolio. And today, with companies being uh, 30, 40 years old, with succession taking place, um, there is an ability to take on a different type of investment. Uh, you know, more where you have more influence, where you can control in some cases, and um, but that requires operating uh, skills, and you're not as much fixed on the IPO aspect uh, as you are on being able to build earnings 
and, and develop the companies more. And, and that, that mindset and that type of opportunity will be very interesting because it's something that the investors very much want. And you know, we will see more and more of that. And that will allow the scalability to take place wh where the gap currently for is formed. Um, I believe the Koreans will quintuple in asset size. You know, the Chinese insurance companies have the ability to, to develop alternative portfolios now, and you know, there's a large number of them. Uh, you know, you've got pension plans uh, throughout, you know, in Taiwan and other countries, uh, and you have the emergence of sovereign wealth throughout a lot of the Southeast Asian countries. As the non-Asian investors are looking to allocate more capital to Asia, and there's a real drive to partake in this economic kind of repositioning. You couple that with the local emergence of the local investors, right? That's a lot of money. And, um, and that's why I said to you in the short term, if all these investors come to market very quickly, right, and there aren't enough good GPs to absorb that capital, um, you know, there, there will be pressure. Uh, it will be difficult for investors to get into funds. Um, you know, there is pressure for funds to be a bit larger. Um, and, you know, but that, that to me is a, is a short term. It's a three to five year after which the market will just go into its own pattern.